My guest on this edition of Connor's Corner is a professor of history at NYU, Martha Hodes, whose recent book, Morning Lincoln, takes an in-depth look at how Americans mourn the death of the president who had just won the Civil War, reunited a nation, and then was assassinated. Why did you decide to write this book, Professor? Most books about Lincoln's assassination draw on public sources. So scholars who are researching the assassination will read newspapers, they'll read sermons, they'll look at the official expressions of condolence. I was interested in personal responses. What did people write in their letters? What did people write in their diaries? How did they feel after they came back from hearing a sermon at church? That's what I wanted to know. How did those personal responses illuminate the aftermath of the Civil War, the meaning of the war, the reuniting of the country, as you mentioned? What surprised you in your research? Maybe I should first say what didn't surprise me, which is that people who loved President Lincoln or supported President Lincoln were shocked and in grief. And I can talk about that. It's all fascinating the way people express those emotions. But what surprised me was the responses that you don't hear about in so many other books, which are um, the responses of people who didn't like President Lincoln. And of course, foremost among those were the defeated Confederates who had just lost the war. And defeated Confederates, I found in private writings, often responded to the assassination with outright glee. So, for example, I found diaries where people are cheering and hurrahing and saying, this is splendid news, um, thanking God for Lincoln's assassination, believing that if God actually allowed the Confederacy to lose, then God must also have allowed Lincoln's assassination. So people rejoiced in private. Um, <clears throat> they, they, were, they were happy that this had happened. Some even felt, some of the diehard Confederates even felt that this was a sign that maybe Union victory wasn't permanent. So that was really interesting to me. I just thought that was fascinating. And it was a really interesting indication of the ongoing unresolved conflict between Union and Confederacy that, that the Civil War hadn't solved. Well, at the time he was assassinated, the Civil War actually hadn't ended. Lee surrendered, but there were still armies in the field on the Confederacy. So did any of those commanding generals have, I don't know, renewed hope or vigor in, in pursuing the war? Well, you're absolutely right that the war had not officially ended. Although the surrender of Robert E. Lee um, was was for most Confederates a sign that the war was over. Some of the diehards did, not so much the generals who really had a sense of, of the military possibilities, but diehard soldiers, people on the home front, some of them did have a momentary sense that Lincoln's assassination meant that the war wasn't over, as I said before, that God did want the Confederacy to win, and that, that they would be able somehow to retain what they wanted in the war, which was their own independent nation. I will say, though, that most Confederates, if I read, if I read ahead in their diaries and letters, just past the assassination, did understand that the war was over. And this is what was so fascinating to me. So on the one hand, they cheered Lincoln's assassination. They cheered John Wilkes Booth, the assassin. But they also were afraid because they believed that Lincoln was moderate enough that he would treat them well or would have treated them well as the defeated party in the war. And most of them were afraid that Lincoln's successor, President Andrew Johnson, would treat them badly. Now, what's so interesting is Johnson... Johnson, was, uh, was his roots were as a poor white Southerner. He'd grown up in Tennessee, although he ended up owning slaves. And people believed that he hated the slaveholding class. Now, that's true. Johnson did not like the slaveholding class. He, he definitely held a grudge against rich white Southerners. But Johnson hated black people more than he hated rich white Southerners. So in the end, his policies worked in favor of the former Confederates. But in the meantime, these Confederates were fearful of what Johnson would do compared to what they imagined Lincoln would do. So they both cheered Lincoln's assassination and in the same breath, I mean, on the same pages in their diaries and letters, called him their best friend. How did Jefferson Davis react to the assassination? Jefferson Davis was on the run at the end of the Civil War. So he was, he was escaping south with a, with a party of people, including his wife, and the Union Army was pursuing him. Jefferson Davis, according to most, you know, most scholarly accounts that don't go in depth, expressed regret for the assassination. But then, when Jefferson Davis was later on trial, one of the witnesses in Davis's trial testified that Jefferson Davis had actually 
expressed a certain amount of support, if you believe his witness, for the assassination, quoting a line from Shakespeare in which the gist of the line was, you know, if John Wilkes Booth had done this right, he would have killed a lot more people besides Lincoln. And of course, Booth did have a group of conspirators and they had hoped to kill Vice President Andrew Johnson and many of the other people in Lincoln's cabinet, Secretary of State William Seward, who they did wound and injure, but he did not die. So it's, it's hard to know. I mean, as a public persona, Davis expressed regret, as did Lee, by the way. Uh, and the idea there was that Robert E. Lee, again, was working on the assumption that Lincoln would have treated the Confederates with a certain amount of moderation. And so they are both often said to have expressed regret over the assassination. How long did it take Jefferson Davis to hear about the assassination since he was on the run and so forth? Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't have the exact answer, but it's a, but it's a great question because it's so fascinating how long it took, well, on the one hand, how quickly the news traveled, and on the other hand, how long it took for the news to get to certain parts of the South, especially for Davis, who was, who was trying not to be anywhere where there were, where there were communications. So there were, there were parts of the North, even California. People in California knew that Lincoln had been assassinated on the very day, well, the next day, the day he died, Saturday, April 15th. He was shot the night of the 14th. On the other hand, it sometimes took weeks for that news to reach remote parts of the South. I don't know exactly when Jefferson Davis found out, but it would have been, it would have had to have been some time later because he was, he was in hiding. I mean, he wasn't in communication with um, major centers of communication. Let's say if you were in a remote area of Mississippi, how long do you think it would take to hear about the assassination? Um, it could take days. It could take weeks. And then if you move a little bit farther west, it could even take months. So I found letters and diaries from, especially from soldiers, and that includes Union soldiers who are fighting the war still, still in camp in the South, who didn't know about the assassination until sometimes mid-May, which is a month later. So the main, the main way to find out was through the telegram. But tel the telegraph lines didn't run everywhere in the South, and of course many of those lines had been cut during the war in the destruction of the Southern landscape. News also came on newspapers by railroad, but many of the railroad lines had been cut by Union forces, again, as part of the destruction of the southern landscape. Uh, and then people who were living out in remote parts of the West might find out by a letter written by someone back east that might take a month or two months to get to them. So even though those immediate moments were, were filled with responses and diaries and letters. When I was writing the book, I had to keep in mind that there were lots of people who didn't even know it had happened until May and sometimes June. Now, how, the African-American soldiers in the Union Army at the time, how did they react? I, I assume that would be a, a personal blow to them. Very much so, yes, that's exactly right. So African-American soldiers in the Union Army, and of course on the home front as well, were were utterly devastated. It's such an interesting question because African American leaders had been critical of Lincoln during the war. They believed that he didn't act as quickly as they wanted him to on emancipation. And some of the more radical white Republicans and white Northerners also were critical of Lincoln. But when Lincoln was assassinated, African Americans, two things happened. One, they were genuinely devastated because they they also, and this is what's so fascinating about Lincoln, just as Confederates believed Lincoln was their best friend, African Americans also, the day after Lincoln died, the day he died, they called him their best friend. So that's, that's first of all, a testament to Lincoln's diplomacy, that both sides could see him that way. So on the one hand, African Americans were genuinely devastated. On the other hand, or I should say at the same time, African Americans and leaders like Frederick Douglass also invoked Lincoln as a political strategy, especially against his successor, President Andrew Johnson, by petitioning Johnson and saying, look, what would Lincoln have done? Your, they called him your noble predecessor, you know, who, who brought us freedom, who wanted us to have equality, who wanted us to have citizenship. Now you must follow in his footsteps. So it was both genuine and it was political strategy to uphold Lincoln as a radical for African Americans. Now, you're listening to Ask the Lawyer with me, Mike Connors. Our guest right now is Martha Hodes. We're talking about her book, Morning Lincoln, and we're talking about some of the reactions of the, pe the people in the United States. As a general rule, the, let's say the average person in, in the North, what was the reaction? I assume it was devastating. That's also a great question. So I will first respond to what you first said, which is true. They were, people were devastated. Tremendous grief, 
Um, one of the things I found often in diaries and letters was that not only did women weep when they heard the news, but men wept when they heard the news. So women would write in their letters and diaries, the men were weeping like children, um, strong men were seen in tears, people were traumatized, um, people, people were in shock. The first thing people did when they got wind of the news, whether it was the arrival of the telegraph or the newspaper headlines delivered at their door, they went outside to confer with other people. You know, today we'd go straight to the Internet. A generation ago, you'd turn on the TV or the radio, like when Kennedy was assassinated. But there were no such media in those days. So people left their homes and went out into the street. And over and over again in diaries and letters, people would say, you know, we looked into one another's faces to confirm that this was true. So you saw this news, you heard this news. If other people were also shocked, crying, uh, walking through the streets in disbelief, then you knew that it was true. People wrote that it was like a terrible dream, a nightmare. Um, people wrote that I felt like I was watching a play on a stage. So what would we say today? Of course, we would say, I felt like I was in a movie. But the other part of the question that's really interesting is that not all white Northerners were Lincoln lovers. There were, of course, the group of Northern Democrats, members of the Northern Democratic Party, who were called the Copperheads. They were named after a poisonous snake. And they were the ones who despised Lincoln all through the war and didn't vote for him. Um, and they were a substantial minority of the Northern population. And like the Confederates, many of these people I found in diaries and letters and other kinds of sources cheered and clapped when they heard the news. And Union soldiers could also be Copperheads, men who were drafted into the war. And those sources are fascinating because some of those Union soldiers were brought up on charges of treason for celebrating the news of the assassination. And then their uh, fellow soldiers would go to court and testify about what they had heard them say. And that was a really fascinating group of sources that I didn't expect to find. So you have a real gamut in the North. But of course, the majority were the grieving, in shock mourners. Lincoln's funeral procession, we'll end on that, but if you can describe to the audience what happened, you know, his funeral procession going from Washington to Illinois. Yes, it was, a, it was really quite an amazing event. So Lincoln's funeral procession, it began with his funeral in Washington, D.C. on April 19th, which was a Wednesday, really just four days after he had died. An amazing process, an enormous, enormous undertaking. And then there was a two-week-long, 1,700-mile journey from Washington, D.C., where Lincoln's body was transported to his hometown, buried in his hometown of Springfield, Illinois. And the, the train made 11 major stops. So it began in Washington. It stopped in Baltimore, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, then New York, Albany, Buffalo, Cleveland, Columbus, Indianapolis, and Chicago before Springfield. The train also made stops in between sometimes in the middle of the night, and no matter where the train stopped, hundreds and hundreds, sometimes thousands of people would come to see it, even if it was just passing slowly through the station. People knew that the, the train companies made schedules of when it would arrive, and they stuck to the schedules, and people came to pay their respects. It could be three in the morning. It could be pouring rain. It could be a completely muddy, dark night. People brought their children People came to see everything that was going on. And then, of course, in the 11 major cities, the body was removed from the train, um, processed to usually a city hall or some place where it could lie in state, and then people would pass by and see the body. So hundreds of thousands of people passed by to see Lincoln's body. And this was also really interesting. On the one hand, it was really majestic and amazing, and people wrote about it saying, I am a participant in history. I've never experienced such an amazing event. On the other hand, what was so interesting about the personal responses is that people also wrote things like, it was so crowded, I couldn't see anything, my pocket was picked, the weather was cold, uh, his face was decayed, it didn't look like I thought it would look, I thought he would look like a grand old man, he didn't, uh, I only got the briefest glance of his face. So people were also dissatisfied, even though overall the experience was one of meant to be one of closure, moving on, especially because the Union was victorious in the end. So it was a really fascinating exercise to read through people's descriptions of the funeral and funeral train, and then, of course, the burial in Springfield, Illinois, and then his body was lowered there and still resides there in quite a beautiful spot that anybody can go see as a tourist in Springfield. 
The name of the book is Morning Lincoln. Where's the best place to get the book? You can go to my website, MarthaHodes.com, and there are different links there where you can buy the book in different places. You can go to your local bookstore. Please feel free to do so. And then you can read the rest of the story for yourself. Morning Lincoln by Martha Hodes. Thank you, Professor Hodes, for being on Ask the Lawyer with me, Mike Connors.